So, we will start today with the third chapter. The third chapter is linear differential equations with constant coefficients, right. So, so far we have been looking at the at linear differential equations in general, generalities on linear differential equations. We have been looking at Ronskians, properties of Ronskians, the abel lewell formula, the method of variation of parameters, which is very general. It is true for all linear equations, whether it is constant coefficients, variable coefficients, it works generally. And the use of a known solution, reduction of order, all these things were true for all linear equations, right. And uh, generalities on Ronskians, linear dependence, linear independence, that a set of solutions set of n solutions is linearly independent if and only if the Ronskian is non-zero. That is the Ronskian condition is both necessary and sufficient for linear independence provided they are the functions are solutions of a nth order linear homogeneous ODE. So, all these things uh, were, were subsumed in chapter 2. Now, we specialize and go to linear differential equations with constant coefficients right the third chapter and uh, I suggest that uh, you pay attention to the main points rather than write down each and every word in this in the slide because it will slow you down considerably. So, this will be put up in the modal anyway you will get the thing as you will see right in the first slide you will see a great deal of stuff is written on each slide and you simply cannot be writing down each and everything. So, the kind of things that we are looking at are the nth order O d again the leading coefficient is 1 if it is not 1 you divide by the leading coefficient and make it 1 then a, a naught a 1 a 2 etcetera are constants we are going to eventually assume they are real constants, but then it does not have to be real constants I mean, as such it can be even complex numbers. But we are going to at some point of time uh, we are going to assume that they are real um, and the r x the function that appearing on the right hand side is the forcing function right. And in this chapter we are going to assume that the forcing function is very special it is a linear combination of exponentials and the method of undetermined coefficients which is going to be the main theme of this chapter works only for these kinds of forcing functions that is it is a form x to the power k e to the power m x and linear combinations of these things right exponential functions and polynomial times exponential functions. This is the class of forcing functions for which the method works the method of undetermined coefficient works. If the forcing function is tan x then you have to apply the method of variation of parameters as we saw yesterday y double prime plus y equal to tan x you have to apply the method of variation of parameters there is no choice in the matter. You can apply the method of undetermined coefficients only when the forcing function is very special that is it is a linear combination of monomials of the form x to the power k times e to the power a x. Then we will uh, move on to Cauchy Euler equations also towards the end of the chapter. The Cauchy Euler equations are of the form x squared y double prime plus x y prime plus constant times y. Notice that the Bessel's function over here is very closely uh, a Cauchy Euler equation. Suppose if I just look at x squared y double prime plus x y prime and minus p squared y. Suppose just these three terms this you see in the Cauchy in the Bessel's equation there are four terms correct there are four terms if you just keep three of those terms then it is a Cauchy Euler equation. So, I can think of the Cauchy Euler equation as a uh, approximation of the Bessel's function Bessel's dif differential equation right. If I look at the x squared y term and put it on the right hand side. So, the, uh, the Bessel, so I can think of the important equations of mathematical physics such as Bessel's e O d as perturbations of the Cauchy Euler equation. So, you cannot I, I mean it is difficult to solve the Bessel's equation, but then you solve an approximation of the Bessel's equation. So, the Cauchy Euler equation is an approximation of an important equation in mathematical physics right. So, that is one important thing to remember. So, let us begin with the uh, with the homogeneous case as always the homogeneous 
uh, case will be studied first, right? Uh, dn y by dx to the n plus a n minus 1, dn minus 1 y by dx n minus 1 plus etcetera plus a naught y equal to 0, that is equation 3.2. You can just write down this equation, you can just take this as a beginning of your of your chapter, rest of the words and all you can, you will get it from Moodle, alright. So, just write down equation 3.2 and we will follow this numbering, there is a consistent numbering in the whole chapter and uh, we shall stick to that. So just write down the main points like right the, like equation 3.2 is our starting point. So first we have to solve the homogeneous equation completely. Then we have to worry about finding a particular solution of the inhomogeneous equation and the complete solution will be the uh, particular solution plus the full solution of the homogeneous equation. So solving the homogeneous equation completely is important and so how do you solve the homogeneous equation? We take as trial solution we take e to the power mx. So, substitute e to the power mx into the ODE. So, differentiate e to the power mx any number of times you are going to get a constant uh, uh, multiple of e to the power mx correct. So, every term in the differential equation will have will be a multiple of e to the power mx after you substitute and you collect all the coefficients together and what are you going to get m to the n plus a n minus 1 m to the n minus 1 plus etcetera plus a naught e to the power m x equal to 0 correct. This is one of the uh, reasons why you take the exponential function as a trial solution because a constant coefficient o d correct. So, now what is the next uh, thing to do? The next thing to do would be to look for a m such that that uh, uh, that polynomial is 0 correct, e, x, e to the power m x is never going to be 0. So, you just factor out the e to the power m x and what do we get? We, we, have, we have to select m so that m is a root of the characteristic equation. That polynomial that you saw in the last uh, in the previous slide is called the characteristic polynomial that is uh, that is the standard terminology and uh, that is uh, uh, and we have the characteristic equation 3.3. So, we must select m to be a root of the characteristic equation. You can call the operator d d x as capital D and of course, see y double prime plus y okay. that can be written as capital D squared y plus y and the differentiation is a linear operator right. So, it is d squared plus 1 applied to y, it is just a symbolic way of writing the differential equation that we are going to resort to that symbolism eventually. People write d d x as capital D, then the differential equation is simply a polynomial in capital D times y, that is correct, it is a, symbol, it's a symbolism and we are going to re, we are going to resort to that eventually. Just in the first few slides, I write the full thing. Okay. So the polynomial 3.3 has n distinct roots m1, m2, mn. Then we have n linearly independent solutions e to the power m1x, e to the power m2x, etc., e to the power mnx. Why are they linearly independent? These functions e to the power m1x, e to the power m2x, e to the power mnx. m1, m2, mn are distinct. So, how does it follow from that that the functions are linearly independent? If you compute the Ronskian of these things, what happens? What is the Ronskian of these? The Ronskian of these n functions is a n by n determinant. What is this n by n determinant? The first row consists of 1s, the second row consists of m1, m2, m3, etc., mn, the third row consists of m1 squared, m2 squared, m3 squared, etc. And then there is a outside the determinant there will be e to the power m1x, e to the power m2x, etc., right. And the exponentials are not going to be 0. So, the question is whether the determinant is 0 or not. So, what is this determinant called? 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, m1, m2, m3, mn m1 squared, m2 squared, m3 squared, mn squared, etc., etc., m1 to the power n minus 1, m2 to the power n minus 1, etc., mn to the power n minus 1. This determinant has a name, right? Do you recall the name? It is called the 
van der Monde determinant. What comes out the Ronskian is the van der Monde determinant. Ronskian at the origin, let us calculate the Ronskian at the origin, right? Because the Ronskian is not 0 at a point, it is never going to be 0. So, let us calculate the Ronskian at the origin. Ronskian at the origin is the van der Monde determinant. What is the van der Monde determinant? 1, 1, etcetera, 1, m1, m2, mn, etcetera, etcetera, etcetera. What is it? m1 to the power n minus 1, etcetera, mn to the power n minus 1. That is the van der Monde determinant. What is the value of the van der Monde determinant? It is not 0, but why is it not 0? What is the value of the van der Monde determinant? But what is the final value? It has a nice, uh, one can actually evaluate the van der Monde determinant. Product m i minus m j i less than j. That is the van value of the van der Monde determinant, correct? It is a product m i minus m j i less than j. And since the m 1, m 2, m n are distinct, we see that the van der Monde determinant is not 0 and the Ronskian is not 0 at origin and hence it is never 0. They are solutions of a linear ODE. So, the these n functions are linearly independent. Can you give another argument for linear independence without using the van der Monde determinant? Assume that m1, m2, mn are real just to begin with. Okay. Assume that m1 less than m2 less than etcetera less than mn. Yeah, but what do you have to show uh, for linear independence? Suppose c1 e to the power m1x plus c2 e to the power m2x plus etcetera plus c n e to the power m n x is identically 0. Ha, then we have to show that all the c1, c2, c n must be 0, but how do you show that? You divide the equation by e to the power m n x, right? Then, this, then the, you have the c n coefficient. What happens to the previous ones? c1 e to the power m1 x minus m n x plus c2 e to the power m2 x minus m n x plus etcetera plus c n minus 1 e to the power m n minus 1 x minus m n x plus c n. This should be 0 for all x. Now, suppose I allow x to go to infinity, what happens? m 1 is less than m 2, m 2 is less than m 3 etcetera, right. So, m 1 minus m n m 2 minus m n etcetera m n minus uh, m n minus 1 minus m n are all negative real numbers, right. So, you have exponential of a negative real real constant times x and I am allowing x to go to infinity. What happens? All the things tends to 0 and so what is left over? C n. So, you see that C n equal to 0. So, from that linear relation C n drops out. Repeat the argument again and again. Correct. So, you will get that all the coefficients are 0. So, now I have given you two different ways to prove that the exponentials e to the power m 1 x e to the power m 2 x etcetera e to the power m n x are linearly independent. Correct. Both these techniques are exceedingly important. They illustrate different principles. One of them is purely algebraic and the computation of the van der Monde determinant is exceedingly important. And the other is purely analytic. Okay, now, the exponents uh, m1, m2, mn may not be real, right? After all, you have a polynomial. 3.3 .3 is a polynomial. The polynomial has real coefficients, all right. But there is no reason why the roots should be real. Take y double prime plus y equal to 0. What will be equation 3.3 .3 in that case? consider the equation y double prime plus y equal to 0. m squared plus 1 equal to 0. What are the roots i n minus i? Now, one must now 
understand what do you mean by e to the power m x when m is a complex number that is the first thing to do. The second thing is to examine whether this argument for linear independence will work in the complex case also. Of course, the van der Mond determinant uh, computing the van value of the van der Mond determinant does not depend upon whether the thing is real or complex that argument will go through. The other analytic argument that I, I gave where we assumed m's are real you have to now re-examine that argument and I leave it to you as an exercise to examine the argument for the complex case and rework the argument in the complex case. More care is required, but it is worth doing it. Uh, now, let us postpone the discussion on complex root, but there is another problem. The characteristic equation 3.3 .3 can have repeated roots. If it has repeated roots, then uh, suppose for example, the characteristic polynomial is m minus 1 to the power n equal to 0. There is only one root, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, rep one repeated n times. Then this procedure only gave us e to the power x. But what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to produce n solutions. We only produced one solution. So, uh, we have to now produce further solutions. Correct. Let us denote the OD by simply by symbolically as Ly equal to 0, right. I mean there is no need to write the whole, there is no need to write the whole expression. The left hand side is a linear operator, nth derivative plus a n minus 1 times the n minus first derivative plus a n minus 2 times the second uh, n minus second derivative etcetera operating on y d n by d x to the power n that is a linear operator d n minus 1 by d x to the n minus 1 that is a linear operator and there and so d n by d x to the power n plus a n minus 1 d n minus 1 by d x to the n minus 1 plus etcetera plus a naught that is a linear operator operating on functions n times differentiable functions right that is a vector space set of all n times differentiable functions on the real line that is a vector space on that vector space you have a linear operator correct. And what are we trying to do? We are trying to determine the kernel of this linear operator that is what we are trying to do right. I mean I can use the language of linear algebra now we are there is a parallel course and linear algebra going on. And so you just denote the operator by L why, why fuss about it and write down the whole thing. So, you have the differential equation is simply written as L y equal to 0. It is a linear operator L operating on y and we are trying to determine the kernel of this that is it. And what have we did? What have we done so far? We have taken, taken a trial solution e to the power m x. So, what is L of e to the power m x? L of e to the power m x is the characteristic polynomial times e to the power m x correct. Let us denote the characteristic polynomial just for simplicity by q of m. So, what do we get? We get L of e to the power m x equal to q m times e to the power m x. This is going to be true for all values of m even if m is a complex number it is true. The right hand side becomes 0 only when q m is 0 that is a fact, but that is an identity L of e to the power m x equal to q m times e to the power m x. This is an identity that holds for all values of m. Is it clear? Absolutely. So, now let us look at this. So, the characteristic polynomial will be always be denoted by q m. Assume that m naught is a repeated root of q m of multiplicity k. What does it mean to say that m naught is a repeated root of multiplicity k? That means that m minus m naught to the power k divides q x q m and no higher power divides q m right. So, assume that m naught is a repeated root of q m of multiplicity k m minus m naught to the power k divides q m and no higher power 
divides q m. But what do you know about repeated roots? Remember that if m naught is a root of multiplicity k, then not only is q m 0, its derivative must be 0 and the k minus 1 derivatives of it must be 0. And since the root has multiplicity k, the kth derivative is not 0 at m naught. Is this, is this a point clear to everybody? And it is an exercise for you to prove this assertion. If you take a polynomial q m and if m is a m naught is a root of multiplicity k, then the q and the first k minus 1 derivatives vanish at m naught and the kth derivative does not vanish at m naught. This is the meaning of saying that the m naught is a root of multiplicity k. Remember that in the complex variables course which you will be taking next uh, which, is a, which is a continuation course for this, again you will see these concepts coming up. The multiplicity of a 0 and the order of a pole, these are the two concepts, you will be generalizing this not only to polynomials, but to analytic functions right. and this concept is very, very important and this equation 3.5 characterizing uh, this is also very important. But how does it help? How does this observation help? The observe that for any m real or complex L of e to the power m x is q m e to the power m x equation 3.6. Now, let us differentiate both sides with respect to m. Let us differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to m. What is going to happen to the right hand side? On the right hand side, you are going to get two terms, right? q prime m e to the power m x plus q m into x e to the power m x. You are differentiating with respect to m remember. So, derivative of the sec, uh, of e to the power m x is x e to the power m x correct. Please remember this. You have to keep a record of uh, with what uh, of the variable with respect to which you are differentiating. You are not differentiating with respect to x, you are differentiating with respect to m the parameter correct. So, the differential operator is a constant coefficient operator in which m does not appear at all correct. There is no m appearing in the differential equation right. It's in the definition of L, there is no parameter involved. So, when you do, so what are we saying? We are saying that we are computing del del m, there are two variables right x and m and we are differentiating with respect to m. So, del del m of l e to the power m x equal to l times del del m of e to the power m x and what is del del m of e to the power m x? x e to the power m x that is the left hand side. What is the right hand side? On the right hand side, we have del del m of q m e to the power m x correct that will produce two terms correct q prime of m e to the power m x plus q m x e to the power m x. So, comparing these two, we are getting the equation 3.7 l x e to the power m x equal to q prime m e to the power m x plus q m x e to the power m x. Is this clear 3.7 equation where it comes from? Now, we substitute m naught in place of m. You substitute m naught in place of m and what do you get? L of x e to the power m naught x equal to q prime of m naught into e to the power m naught x plus q m naught into x e to the power m naught x. But we know that m naught is a root of multiplicity greater than 1. So, q of m naught is 0 and q 
q prime of m naught is 0. So, both terms on the right hand side are 0. So, L of x e to the power m naught x equal to 0. So, x e to the power m naught x is also a solution of the ODE that is also in the kernel of L. So, now we have two things in the kernel namely e to the power m naught x and x e to the power m naught x. So, do you understand now where that thing comes from? In the, uh, when you have a multiple root, the solutions are e to the power m naught x, x e to the power m naught x, etcetera. Is it clear? Any questions on this? Right. So, shall we proceed further with this? Okay. Then what do you do? You have to pro, uh, the, thus x e to the power m naught x is also a solution of the ODE in addition to e to the power m naught x. The procedure obviously generalizes to give the following result. If m naught is a root of multiplicity k of the characteristic polynomial, then the ODE has solutions e to the power m naught x, x e to the power m naught x, etcetera, x to the power k minus 1 e to the power m naught x. So, you will have a list of k solutions and if m1, m2, ml is a list of distinct roots with multiplicities k1, k2, kl, then the sum of the multiplicities of the roots must add up to the degree of the, uh, of the characteristic polynomial, correct. And what do we get? We get the O D has solutions e to the power m 1 x, x e to the power m 1 x etcetera, x to the power k minus 1 e to the power m 1 x, e to the power m 2 x, x e to the power m 2 x etcetera, e x to the power k 2 minus 1 e to the power m 2 x etcetera, 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 e to the power m l x, x e to the power m l x all the way up to x k, uh, k sub l minus 1 e to the power m l x. How many solutions have been displayed here? N of them and it is an exercise for you to show that this is a complete list of solutions of the homogeneous equation. So, I have a basis of solutions for the homogeneous uh, linear ODE, correct. So, that is an exercise for you, tutorial 4 has already begun these exercises please uh, start thinking about these things. All right. In the afternoon, we shall take up the three previous tutorial sheet and we shall complete them. In the afternoon, there will also be a quiz, remember. Now, let us go to the list of, you want the, you want the slide again? It, uh, it, it is the, all that I am saying in the previous slide is that this is a complete list, that is all. You can just Okay, write it down. Let me just say, say it again. Prove that these solutions are linearly independent, the complete list of solutions. I just quickly write it down. Once again, try to, of course, if you try to compute the Ronskin of this whole system, you are going to get into a serious mess. You are going to just bury yourself in a morass of algebra out of which you are never going to get out. So, do not try to compute the Ronskin of this, try to, try to give an analytical argument, right. Yeah. So, some of, so these things are probably familiar to you by teaching these uh, engineering students, but uh, how these things come from? e to the power m x, x e to the power m x, x squared e to the power m x that is probably uh, not uh, so familiar. The idea of differentiating the differential equation with respect to m, differentiating an identity with respect to m that was familiar. Okay, very good. So, let us look at the case of complex roots. So, we are going to assume here that the coefficients a 1 a uh, a naught a 1 a n minus 1 appearing in the O D E are real. In that case, the characteristic polynomial has real coefficients, it is a, it's a polynomial over the real numbers. 
So, complex roots whenever they appear, they will appear in conjugate pairs, correct. More precisely, if A plus I B is a complex root of multiplicity K, then A minus I B is also a root of multiplicity K, correct. You have to prove this as an exercise. Then I would like you to recall Euler's formula e to the power i theta equal to cos theta plus i times sin theta. Now here let me ask you a certain question. The right hand side is very clear what it means. What is the meaning of the left hand side e to the power i theta? What is the definition of the left hand side? The exponential function is defined as a power series e to the power z is 1 plus z plus z squared upon 2 factorial plus z cube upon 3 factorial etc. It is a power series over the complex numbers and the radius of convergence of this power series is infinite. You will see the details of this in the complex variables course right and this is a power uh, this is a power series with infinite radius of convergence and this is a take, supposed to be taken as the definition of the exponential function all right. So, if m naught equal to a plus i b is a complex root then e to the power m naught x equal to e to the power a x plus i b x. Now, the complex now uh, what have I said e to the power z is defined as a power series right over the complex numbers this power series has infinite radius of convergence and you prove by multiplying the two power series that e to the power z1 plus z2 is e to the power z1 into e to the power z2. The multiplication theorem for uh, exponential functions is proved using power series. The Cauchy product of two power series has to be taken details will be relegated to the complex variables course. So, what is this? This is e to the power a x into e to the power i b x and by Euler's formula e to the power i b x is cos b x plus i times sin b x correct. So, you have the solution e to the power m naught x equal to e to the power a x cos b x plus i times e to the power a x sin b x. Now, m naught bar which is a minus i b is also a root. So, you get the solution e to the power a x cos b x minus i times e to the power a x sin b x. Now, our differential equation remember is a homogeneous linear differential equation. So, the solutions form a vector space. So, if you have two solutions I can take the sum and difference correct and I can take their linear combinations that will also be a solution the superposition principle. So, if I take a linear combination half uh, with, with coefficients half and half I will get half times e to the power m naught x plus e to the power m naught bar x is also a solution and the other co linear combination that I am interested is 1 over 2 i into e to the power m naught x minus e to the power m naught bar x that is also a solution. What is the advantage of take, taking these things? The i goes away and you get a pair of real solutions. After all in engineering you are interested in real solutions right. The solutions present themselves in complex form. Two solutions have presented themselves in complex form. You take linear combinations and you want real solutions okay. So, oh, here it is m naught m naught bar is the pair a plus minus i b. So, corresponding to this pair m naught m naught bar we have the pair of real solutions e to the power a x cos b x e to the power a x sin b x. So, complex roots appear in conjugate pairs and so for a pair of roots m naught m naught bar we have a pair of solutions real solutions e to the power a x cos b x e to the power a x sin b x. If you want you can work with the complex solutions e to the power m naught x comma e to the power m naught bar x. So, you can work with a pair of complex solutions e to the power m naught x e to the power m naught bar x or you can work with a real pair e to the power a x cos b x and e to the power a x 
sin b x. Now, what happens if the complex root a plus minus i b is uh, are roots of multiplicity k? If a plus i b is a root of multiplicity k, then a minus i b also must have multiplicity k. Then we have solutions e to the power m naught x, x e to the power m naught x, etc. x to the power k minus one e to the power m naught x. That's one list for m naught, and the list for m naught bar, the next row e to the power m naught x, x e to the power m, so excuse me, e to the power m naught bar x, x e to the power m naught bar x, etc. x to the power k minus one e to the power m naught bar x. Then again by taking Com, uh, linear combinations as before, we get 2 k real solutions, correct? A plus i b is a root of multiplicity k, a minus i b is a root of multiplicity k. So, all in all we have 2 k roots and I have to produce 2 k solutions, correct? And what are those 2 k solutions? Here it is e to the power a x cos b x e to the power a x sin b x x e to the power a x cos b x x e to the power a x sin b x x square e to the power a x cos b x x square e to the power a x sin b x etcetera 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 x to the power k minus 1 e to the power a x cos b x x to the power k minus 1 e to the power a x sin b x correct. This is a complete list of 2k solutions corresponding to the roots a plus minus i b each of multiplicity k. So, exercise as, as usual show that these are linearly independent and by putting these solutions together corresponding to all the roots we get a basis of solutions of the ODE. Right. Is this point clear? All right. So, now we know how to compute a basis of solutions for the homogeneous nth order linear OD with constant coefficients. That part, that problem has been completely resolved. Of course, you should be able to solve that polynomial equation. That is not an easy task, correct. So, if you if granted that you can solve the characteristic polynomial uh, equation, characteristic polynomial equation, you can completely write down the basis of solutions for the homogeneous nth order linear OD with constant coefficients. Right. What is the next thing in the agenda? The what happens when there is a forcing function, correct? Then we need to find a particular solution of the forced uh, for the inhomogeneous equation. Is that right? So before we take up this problem, let us take this exercise, let us take a special case of this exercise. Uh, let us look at a very simple example. The last part, right? Putting these solutions together corresponding to all the roots, we get a basis of solutions of the OD. So, let us suppose that the roots are, let us say, i minus i. 2i minus 2i, 3i minus 3i. Right? Then what are the what are the corresponding solutions? I'm telling you the roots. I'm telling you the roots of the characteristic equation are plus minus i, plus minus 2i, plus minus 3i. So what are the solutions? Six of them. Sin x cos x sin 2x cos 2x, sin 3x cos 3x. How do you show that this list of 6 functions is linearly independent and more generally how do you show that sin x comma cos x comma sin 2x comma cos 2x comma etcetera etcetera etcetera, sin nx comma cos nx. How is this, how do you show that this list of 2n functions is a linearly independent set of functions? We need to resort to orthogonality. What is the meaning of orthogonality for these functions? We need to define an inner product, namely 
inner product of f and g is integral f of x g of x dx between which limits for this particular in this particular context minus pi to pi or 0 to 2 pi and you show that if you uh, cos m x cos n x integral from minus pi to pi d x is 0 if n is not equal to m. Same for sin n x and sin m x and cos n x and sin m x correct and so that is so this list of functions gives you an orthogonal family of functions and orthogonality implies linear independence because none of them is a 0 function correct. So, in the case of trigonometric functions you resort to orthogonality to prove linear independence. There are various other methods of doing it of course, I will tell you another method. You see suppose uh, you say let us look at a simple case cos x cos 2 x cos 3 x just for illustrating. So, c 1 cos x plus c 2 cos 2 x plus c 3 cos 3 x is 0 correct. Now, of course, you can take derivatives, but then if there are n of them then it um, is going to get messy and it is not as nice as the exponential case right. When you differentiate a cos it becomes a sin, when you differentiate a sin it becomes a cos and there are and, and, the, and, and the, there are pluses and minuses floating around. So, the situation is going to get more complicated, you are not going to get a nice van der Mond determinant. Now, if you put you could, if you put if you specialize the values of x, then that is also going to get messy because you will have to put it at pi by 2, pi by 3, pi by 6, pi by uh, pi by n, and things are going to get messy. So, what is an elegant way to do it? Of course, orthogonality is an elegant way to do it, but, you, but then you want, want to know whether there is any other method, right? Now, so let us go back. So, just for illustration, take a simple case c 1 cos x plus c 2 cos 2 x plus c 3 cos 3 x equal to 0. Now, just because there are just 3 functions just do not go on differentiate and do it. So, look for the look for a method that will generalize to n always. Now, you have this for all x real correct, will it also be true for all x complex? Suppose I tell you c 1 cos x plus c 2 cos 2 x plus c 3 cos 3 x is 0 for all real values of x. Does it follow that it will also be true for complex values? It will follow because when two analytic functions agree on the real axis, they will agree everywhere. Once again I am giving you a preview of what is good to come in the next course. Right? it is always a good to tie up these courses together. So, moment you know that c 1 cos x plus c 2 cos 2 x plus c 3 cos 3 x is 0 for all real x, it is also true for all complex x. So, suppose I replace x by i x, then you get c 1 cos x plus c 2 cos 2 x plus c 3 cos 3 x equal to then from the trigonometric case you have gone to the hyperbolic case. Then the usual trick divide by e to the power 3 x and allow x to go to infinity and c 3 will be 0 and so it goes correct. So, essentially trigonometric functions are special case of exponential functions. So, ultimately you can re somehow reduce it to the study of exponential functions. So, this is also another way of doing it right, is this clear, is the procedure clear. So, now let us proceed to the computation of the particular integral for L y equal to R x assume that the forcing function r x is a sum of terms of the form x to the power k e to the power m x, where k is an integer k not k 
k non uh, non negative and m is a complex number why is m complex i do not want to give a special treatment to trigonometric functions trigonometric functions are special cases of exponential functions so i will just study the case of exponential functions and the trigonometric the case of trigonometric functions follows okay that is a correct way to do it and that is a modern way of doing it. So, our O d is what? Our O d is nth derivative of y plus summation j from 0 to n minus 1 a j j the derivative of y equal to r x and I am assuming that r x is a linear combination of monomials of the form x to the power k e to the power m k x. These are called exponential monomials, they are not polynomial monomials but exponential monomials let us call them exponential monomials. So, we have an ex, a bunch of exponential monomials and as you said before you simply abbreviate d d x by capital D and d uh, and the j th derivative is simply capital uh, capital d to the j and so the left hand side of the equation 3.8 can be conveniently written as q d times y where q is the characteristic polynomial absolutely characteristic polynomial. Now, tell me suppose you find particular solutions y p 1 and y p 2 of q d y equal to r 1 x and q d y equal to r 2 x right and you already found and y p 1 is a solution of the first and y p 2 is a solution of the second. Now, suppose I take a linear combination of y p 1 and y p 2. What, I, what, what will this be? This will be a particular solution of what? Q d of y equal to alpha r 1 x plus beta r 2 x correct? Is that, is that right? So, it is enough to solve, it is enough to determine the particular solution of Q d of y equal to x to the power k e to the power m k x that is all. So, you just have to take the right hand side to be a exponential monomial and finish the problem. So, we can really concentrate our attention on how to deal with a exponential monomial and the problem is finished. Point is if you solve the inhomogeneous equation with an exponential monomial then it be, uh, then we can we find in for each exponential monomial you find the particular integral and you take the corresponding linear combination of the particular integrals and you get a particular integral for the exponential polynomial as a forcing function. In other words, you have two different right hand sides r 1 and r 2 with r 1 as a forcing function you find the particular integral y p 1 with r 2 as a forcing function you find the particular integral y p 2. Now, I want to solve find the particular uh, integral with alpha r 1 plus beta r 2 as the right hand side. What is it? It is simply alpha y p 1 plus beta y p 2 that is all nothing else. In other words when you have a pol exponential polynomial on the right hand side when you have a, a linear combination of exponential monomials you take each monomial individually and deal with the problem and find the particular solution one at a time and take the appropriate linear combination of the particular solutions. Is that correct? Have you understood the simplification? So, what do we have to now focus our attention on? We just have to focus our attention on equation 3.9 that is all q d of y equal to x to the power k e to the power m k x that is all that we have to understand. What is the importance of taking the exponential polynomials? Because this is the only class for which the method of undetermined coefficients will work number one. Number two, we are now we are stopping here with finite linear combinations correct. Now, suppose I take a general right hand side, suppose I take a right hand side r x which is let us say a 2 pi periodic function. I can always write r, uh, r x as a Fourier series which is an infinite linear combinations of sines and cosines, but for each summoned we have found the particular integral. Now, uh, so now we should be taking a infinite 
linear combination of these particular integrals and examine the convergence properties of that correct. So, the theory of Fourier series is all about this. So, we are just so the idea is that if you do it for exponential polynomials exponential polynomials and by taking linear combinations you are creating a large function space which is and if I take limits of these then I can get a very rich class of right hand sides for which you can solve the problem. And the theory of Fourier series will tell you that if I, if I, if I restrict ourselves to purely imaginary uh, exponentials e to the power m x where m is purely imaginary and if I just take the monom if I just take even that class e to the uh, in other words if I just if I simply restrict myself to sines and cosines sin x sin 2 x sin 3 x 1 cos x cos 2 x etcetera even then I get quite a substantial uh, results because all the all the periodic forcing functions will be taken care of by this process. Correct. So, the exponential monomials are the most important ones, they are the building blocks, they are the building blocks, but here the the, the it is not simply it is not simply finite linear combinations after you take the finite linear combinations you should go a step further and try to see and try to study the problem of taking infinite linear combination. In other words, you have to uh, get into issues of convergence that is a different chapter altogether, perhaps a different course the issue of convergence of these things. So, before we get to that point we should first understand the simple case right. Yeah. Any other questions? We are going to do that, we are going to look, look at lots of examples. Okay. So, let us determine, so let us take an example, here is an example. That is go, the topic of the next course, the next course will focus on Fourier series and Fourier transforms. In some sense the method of Laplace transforms, what, what is the Laplace transform? The Laplace transform of a function f of x is integral f x e to the power minus s x dx. What are you doing when you compute the Laplace transform of a function f of x? You are taking an continuous linear combination of exponentials right. So, the method of Laplace transform is an illustration of this. I told you Fourier series Laplace transform is another illustration of this we will come to that that is a separate chapter. This is infinite business is a separate chapter altogether. It is not here we are looking at the algebraic aspects of the problem right. So, let us now determine a particular integral of y double prime minus 2 y prime plus y equal to e to the power x. Here you can please write down just the basic points quickly and hurry up with the writing. Let us not waste too much time in writing all the details. So, just write the equation 3.10 y double prime minus 2 y prime plus y equal to e to the power x. What is the complementary function? First you have to find the characteristic polynomial. What is the characteristic polynomial? m squared minus 2 m plus 1 equal to 0 that is m minus 1 squared equal to 0. So, what are the roots 1 and 1. So, what is the complementary function c 1 e to the power x plus c 2 x e to the power x. Please write as I please write simultaneously. So, now what are we doing? We we are is uh, we take a particular integral right y p is a particular solution that means that it must satisfy the differential equation that means that d minus 1 squared y p equal to e to the power x right. Now, observe that d minus 1 of e to the power x is 0 
when I apply d minus 1 to e to the power x, what do I get? 0. So, if I take equation 3.11, please write simultaneously. If I take equation 3.11 and apply d minus 1 to both sides, what do I get? The right hand side becomes 0. In other words, I have annihilated the right hand side. I have to find the constant coefficient operator, namely d minus 1, which when applied to the right hand side annihilates it. Correct? You have to annihilate the right hand side using a constant coefficient differential operator. So, in this particular example, that particular uh, differential operator is d minus 1. d minus 1 annihilates the right hand side e to the power x. So, apply d minus 1 to equation 3.11 and you get a homogeneous higher order ODE d minus 1 cube y p equal to 0. But now you know how to solve a homogeneous ODE of the third order, right? What is the solution of this d minus 1 cube y p equal to 0? It is c 1 e to the power x plus c 2 x e to the power x plus a x squared e to the power x. So, y p has to be of this form c 1 e to the power x plus c 2 x e to the power x plus a x squared e to the power x. So, this is your y p. Now, in this y p, there is some part of this y p which already appears in the complementary function, right. Now, there is no need to take this part. So, I can just knock off the c 1 e to the power x and c 2 x e to the power x and just retain a x squared e to the power x. So, that, that is still a particular integral. So, if I take one particular integral and subtract of a complementary function, I will get, I will still get a particular integral. So, the form of the particular integral that we should take is a x squared e to the power x, correct. So, now what remains now? To find a. So, as yet a is a undetermined coefficient and the problem is to find the undetermined coefficient a. So, that is why this problem is that is why this procedure is called the method of undetermined coefficients. So, now let us proceed to find the undetermined coefficient a. Okay. Okay. So, the comments that I made are now explicitly written here and uh, since c 1 e to the power x plus c 2 x e to the power x is already a part of the complementary function, we may strike them off and write down y p as a x squared e to the power x. Our job will be over as soon as we determine a. a is the undetermined coefficient. So, now how do you find this undetermined coefficient? Remember that y p is a solution of our O d d minus 1 squared y equal to e to the power x. Remember? So, we substitute the ansatz 3.12, the formulation, the form of the particular solution, right? We have taken y p to be this form. This, this particular thing is uh, substituted into the differential equation. What is the differential equation? d minus 1 squared y p equal to e to the power x. Okay. So, we get a comes out d minus 1 squared is a linear operator. So, a comes out so a into d minus 1 squared x squared e to the power x on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we have simply e to the power x. So, now do the now work out. So, let us work it out systematically. First apply the d minus 1 first. d minus 1 squared is first apply d minus 1 and then again you apply d minus 1. So, one application of d minus 1 to x squared e to the power x gives you 2x e to the power x. One application of d minus 1 to x squared e to the power x gives you 2x 
e to the power x correct. Applied again the 2 comes out it is a after all a linear operator. So, 2 a into d minus 1 applied to x e to the power x is again simply e to the power x. You ask me yeah 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 it is equivalent to substituting into the differential equation, but this is slightly more efficient way of doing it. So, you get 2 a e to the power x is simply e to the power x or a equal to half and so we have determined the undetermined coefficient finally and our y p is half x squared e to the power x. Is the example clear to everybody? how to compute the undetermined coefficient. So, what is the main point? The main point is to annihilate the right hand side via a constant coefficient differential operator correct. So, that y p is a solution of a higher order constant coefficient operator and so the full thing can be written down the full y, y p can be written down whatever is the part of the complementary function strike it out others will remain with coefficients a b c d etcetera and you have to determine a b c d the undetermined coefficients have to be determined. So, this, this is one of the most important procedures and what one may describe as the meat and potatoes of a course uh, of the of a course on ODs undergraduate course on ODs. One of the mathematicians Giancarlo wrote a wrote a article on teaching of differential equations where he calls this constant coefficient uh, ODs with exponential right hand sides. The procedure method of undetermined coefficients is described as a meat and potatoes of a course. So, you will find books uh, if you read books they will uh, they will devote a large chapter to this large number of exercises will be worked out if you read Boys de Prima or Krasig, but they do not talk about annihilators, they talk about rules for writing the form of the particular integral, but I always prefer to apply the annihilator, annihilate the right hand side, write down y p, strike out the whatever is a part of the complementary function, this is systematic, go about the job systematically. You can try to find other, it is it is ultimately a question of formatting your solution, it ultimately boils down to that. The procedure is pretty straightforward. you could format it in different ways, but remember many books talk about rules for writing down the y p, they give you tables of these rules, but I find that students get confused when I do it this, when I apply this particular formatting it is very clear. Uh, so, sometimes I give y double prime plus y equal to x sin x and ask for the form of the particular integral. The students if you try, try to ap apply some rules, they apply it wrong and they get a wrong result. So, I would not recommend any other formatting except this formatting. So, if n is large, then the, if the, n is large, then anyway the computation is difficult. Ultimately, I can always make it larger and larger so that it goes outside the realm of uh, human computation that any problem ultimately can be uh, can be made so complicated that you, you it will whatever you give me whatever formatting you come up with I can always give you a problem where it is going to be terribly cumbersome that is a there is no solution to that that is the next point that we are going to come to. So, the point is to the point is to annihilate the forcing function R x via a polynomial p d so as to obtain a higher order constant coefficient homogeneous linear o d for y p. You do not have to write down all these things, you just write down the table just we need a list of annihilators now. No, it is pretty easy. What is e to the power what annihilates e to the power a x d minus a? What annihilates x to the power a x to the power k e to the power a x? d minus a to the power k minus 1. Now, I claim that this formatting is better, it is just my experience. Students, I teach these students 
people who do not come to class, they do not, they have to rely on crazy and boys diploma and they have got it wrong straight away. I can tell you that. But just by experience, I am saying that the, the formatting that I am recommending is better in some sense. You could try it out, you could experiment it with your own class. You can try the, the rules, giving them rules and you can try this method and you will see for yourself how many students get it wrong. It is a time tested thing, it is simply a time tested thing. I mean it is up to you, I mean if you think that that other procedure is better, I mean writing down some other set of rules is better, it is question of formatting, I mean you have to follow what formatting you, you like. I am recommending this because my students the IIT students have fallen into the trap of getting wrong forms of the particular integral. So, you can fill in the, it is entirely up to you. He is right, he is reading boys de prima, that is a pro, this particular procedure is not described in Krasig, this is not described in boys de prima, that is what I am trying to tell you. This is described only in Ostberg and Finney, now that book is out of print, okay. And I have been teaching this in Minnesota and that was a textbook and this procedure I find over the past 20 years, I find this procedure very clear. What is laid down is very clear, all the steps are there. When you take the YP and when you annihilate the right hand side, you actually see in front of you the higher order OD and you write down the full solution of the higher order OD and you are actually cancelling out whatever is there in the complementary function. Your first step is to add the complementary function, that is the correct procedure and you already have written the complementary function and you are cancelling that off. There is very little scope for making a mistake. Another problem that you have to remember one thing is that when a student makes a mistake or when you make a mistake in the, in, in the blackboard, you have to go back and troubleshoot and so when you write this down in this, in this format, troubleshooting becomes easier. Any other thing? you have to go and uh, you have to go back and you know break your head trying to uh, correct the errors. Now, I, I, like I said, I mean you are all teachers, I mean you can, you also have your experience, but it is a question of formatting. I am recommending this, but if you do not want to follow the recommendations, it is entirely up to you. So, here is an exercise for you, tutorial sheet number 4. Suppose P1 D and P2 D annihilate Y1 and Y2 respectively then y1 plus y2 is annihilated by the LCM, prove this, it is very easy to do this. Example, let us try to find the annihilator for x sin x. So, let us write sin x as e to the power i x minus e to the power minus i x upon 2 i, correct. What is the annihilator for the first term x e to the power i x from the previous table you have it already, d minus i the whole squared. Second term is annihilated by what? d plus i the whole squared. What is the LCM of these two objects? The LCM is just the product, right? They do not have any common factors. d minus i the whole squared and d plus i the whole squared do not have any common factors. So, the LCM is just the product and so the LCM d squared plus 1 the whole squared is annihilator for x sin x. Similarly, for x cos x, same thing will be true, correct. So, immediately we see how to enlarge the table. So, it is very clear what will happen when I have x squared sin x, x cube sin x, uh, it is pretty clear what is going to what is going to happen, right. So, if y 1 and y 2, if you have annihilators for y 1 and y 2, you have an annihilator for y 1 plus y 2, it is simply the LCM. So, the table that we wrote down can be enlarged further function e to the power a x annihilator is d minus a x to the power k e to the power a x annihilator is d minus a to the power k plus 1. You do not even have to enlarge it because if you believe that if you accept the fact that sines and cosines are special cases of exponentials, then you do not have to enlarge the table at all. All that you really need is the x to the power k e to the power a x nanohelator is d minus a to the power k plus 1. That is the only thing that you have to remember. Everything else follows. 
because you, when you have a trigonometric function, you simply write it as a, a linear combination of complex exponentials and you are finished. And you use the form uh, rule that if y1 and y2 uh, are annihilated by p1 and p2 respectively, then y1 plus y2 is annihilated by the LCM. So, if I have annihilators for y1, y2, y3, y4, you take the LCM of the respective annihilators, the individual annihilators, that is it, correct. So, if you want just for convenience, you can enlarge the table x to the uh, sin x cos x, sin b x cos b x, annihilators d squared plus b squared, x to the power k sin b x, x to the power k cos b x, d squared plus b squared to the power k plus 1. Exercise, find the annihilator of e to the power a x cos b x and e to the power a x sin b x. Take e to the power a x cos b x, write it as a sum of complex exponentials and use the same formula LCM e to the power b cos b x is e to the power i b x plus e to the power minus i b x upon 2 and so you are looking at e to the power a plus i b x by 2 and e to the power a minus i b x upon 2. What are the annihilators? d minus a plus i b, d minus a minus i b. What is the LCM? Why divided by 2? Annihilator d minus a plus i b, d plus a minus, I, so, so excuse me, t minus a plus i b, d minus a minus i b. The LCM is what? d minus a squared plus b squared. So, the exercise goes further, enlarge the table further. So, you do it and you get the hang of it. So, now the next slide I am going to put a large list of problems. That will be tutorial number 4. So, tutorial 4 has already begun and I am assuming that you have started solving some of the exercises in tutorial 3. So, you enlarge the table further. You try try to do it. It's certainly well worth doing it because you get you get a same process you have to follow, and the table keeps becoming longer and longer. Either you have to use LCM method or you have to enlarge the table. One of the two. All right. So here you have lots of fun. Solve y double prime plus y equal to sin x. Solve y double prime plus y equal to cos x. Simultaneously, you can solve both of them because you can annihilate both of them simultaneously by applying d squared plus 1, correct. Both the problems can be done at one stroke. Solve y double prime plus y equal to sin 3 x into sin 2 x, second one. Are you going to find the annihilator for the product? No. We have to use sin 3 x sin 2 x has to be defactorized as a linear combination of a cos x and cos 5 x. Cos 5 x is not going to give you any trouble, the cos x is going to give you some trouble, right. You have to solve y double prime plus y equal to cos x separately, y double prime plus y equal to cos 5 x separately and the uh, when y double prime plus y equal to cos x has been solved in the previous exercise, correct. The next problem is d to the power 4 plus 1 equal to 0. What is the characteristic polynomial? m to the power 4 plus 1 equal to 0 or m to the power 4 is minus 1. So, you have to look at the fourth roots of minus 1. What are the fourth roots of minus 1? Not repeated, roots are not repeated. Huh? No, they, the plus or minus i will give the root fourth roots of 1. You want the fourth roots of minus 1 divided by root 2. It is what e to the power i pi by 4, e to the power 3 pi i by 4, e to the power 7. Uh, 
okay in the four in the four quadrants again okay so e to the power i pi by 4 is okay once you find e to the power i pi by 4 then complex root appear in conjugate pairs so e to the power minus i pi by 4 is also a, uh, also a root and in this particular algebraic equation if m is a root minus m is also a root correct so the four roots can be written down so 1 over root 2 plus i over root 2 1 over root 2 minus i over root 2 and then negatives they are also solution so you have the four distinct roots you have four distinct roots you can write down four linearly independent so, and then question number four is pretty routine question number four item number one the right hand side is e to the power x, its annihilator is d minus 1, and the next one the annihilator is d squared plus 1. The third one and the fourth one, what is the annihilator for the fourth one? x squared e to the power x, 1 raised to the power, exactly d minus 1 cube and for the third one e to the power x cos x. d minus 1 squared plus 1 right absolutely right so the uh, so you have the annihilators for all the right hand sides and you can use the annihilator method to advantage and the question number 5 asks you to write down the form of the particular integral now when you ask this kind of a question write down the form of the particular integral what I mean here is that whatever is there in the complementary function should be knocked out remember it is a question of procedure and the procedure should be efficient now I could take uh, the form of the particular integral to be c1 cos uh, suppose for example I take y double prime plus y equal to sin x the simple example right the form of the particular integral will be what c1 cos x plus c2 sin x plus ax cos x plus bx sin x and then I will be call cancelling the whatever is there in the complementary function. If you do not do it and you substitute the whole thing there, you are going to be doing unnecessary work. So, that is a negative feature. So, when I ask for the form of the particular integral, the student has to knock out the part of the complementary function. If the student does not do that, it is a strategic error because the algorithm gets more heavier or some student may write, you would take the form of the particular integral to be c1 cos x plus c2 sin x plus a x cos x plus b x sin x plus uh, e x squared cos x plus f x squared sin x and you will substitute the whole thing and you will get c1, c2 anyway will drop out and then you will get e equal to 0, f equal to 0, but that again is an inefficient way of doing it. You have put in spurious things that are not supposed to be there. So, I want the form of the particular solution with the least number of terms, okay. nothing extra should be there, the least number of summons, is this point clear? and for each of the following. So, y double prime plus y equal to x cube sin x. What is the annihilator for x cube sin x? x cube sin x d squared plus 1 to the power 4 absolutely. x cube sin x the annihilator is d squared plus 1 to the power 4. So, yp, so when you annihilate it, you are going to get d squared plus 1 to the power 5 yp equal to 0. Okay, and then the yp will have to be written down c1 cos x plus c2 sin x plus ax cos x plus bx sin x, etcetera. And the c1 is the first two th things have to be cancelled out. Is that clear?
does there exist a homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients whose general solution is c 1 x squared e to the power x plus c 2 x cube e to the power x. Yesterday I asked you the same question, does there exist a homogeneous differential equation whose general solution is this, but now I am saying homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients whose general solution is this, there are two questions. Yesterday you will see the same thing, but slightly different yesterday, but now I want a constant coefficient. What do you think? Answer is yes or no? You think there will be a homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients whose general solution is this? No, why not? What are the least order you need for these to be solutions? Fourth order. If you want, if you demand that the differential equation should have constant coefficients, then the, then you, it should have at least a fourth order equation, then this cannot be the general solution. General solution will have four arbitrary constants, but if you allow the variable coefficient equation, then it is possible on the positive real line, where the Ronskin is 0 at the origin. So, the differential equation will, will not, will have to be defined on the positive real, that is yesterday's question by the way. And the last problem is interesting, the roots of the characteristic polynomial are all non-real, that is they are all complex. Given that for every solution y x, the solution is bounded, then what can you say about the roots? Where must the roots lie in the complex plane? Can it lie in the first quadrant? Can it lie in the third quadrant? Can it lie in the second quadrant? Fourth quadrant? I mean, what is the location? You have to give, describe the geometrical location of the roots of the circle. Why? Not necessarily. The roots can be three plus four i. I mean, all the roots don't have to have to lie on a circle. There are only n roots. Huh? I think think about this problem. You think think about this problem, and we'll close today here. Okay? And we'll discuss these exercises tomorrow.